Hi everybody, this is just a part 3, an update video of the HP8920 uh, radio communications test set repair. Um, you'll notice from the, uh, if you watched the videos previously for part 2 and part 1 of the repair that we had a power supply issue which we still got uh, in this test set. Um, ultimately the repair was done on the power supply via a professional company who then couldn't get it going they turned it back to me I then managed to find a diagram and uh, try and repair the power supply back to manufacturer spec which I managed to do um, but then what happened was I found a second problem which was that the power supply wasn't keeping regulation and uh, initially that looked as if it was unrelated to the power supply it looked as if it was related to the regulator board inside the the test set which then supplies all the modules within the test set um, and it also at one stage looked like as if regulator ICs on the regulator board had blown I uh, subsequently found that wasn't the case that was an error on my part uh, which I'll show you in a moment as a reason for that which uh, anybody approaching a repair on these test sets needs to know so stay tuned for that the other thing is is that um, I wasn't sure how much load that the um, controller and all the modules and options inside took from the power supply um, so although I was getting a, an output in all cases from the power supply whichever input voltage I chose was 110 to 40 volts I didn't know how much current the, power, the actual test set took from the power supply what it should take and so without that information which isn't quoted in the manuals either the fixed level repair manual the, um, or the circuit diagrams and all the supporting information from HP Agilent doesn't tell you that information so I was looking for external problems from the power supply things to do with the test set itself uh, shorts um, other issues that could, could present so after doing a lot of exhaustive testing um, I found that there wasn't an issue with the test set it was definitely the power supply now what you'll find with these is that the regulator board inside um, the unit which is separate to the power supply has a separate return path for the ground and without that separate return path being in situ via the motherboard of the test set um, you won't get the voltage regulators to operate correctly and I only found that out after a lot of tracing and basically if we look at the um, level repair manual we just appear to show a ground connection here and then we've got the voltage regulators here feeding off to the motherboard that's not exactly accurate this diagram there's two problems with this diagram J1 on the power supply um, is is what we look at when we're dealing with the power supply unit but there's also a J1 on the regulator board and the two get confused in the context of this diagram so be aware of that if you're dealing with these test sets the other thing is is that there is a separate ground path um, because the 12 volt the 14 volt plus or minus rails have a separate return uh, the 5 volt rail has a separate return uh, the 43 volt rail shares the same return as the 14 volt rails some of the returns for like the 5 volt supply go across to the regulator board but the returns for the minus 14 don't they actually leave the power supply and enter the HP8920 motherboard where they are linked back on a separate wire to the regulator board so what that means is if you look at part 2 uh, or indeed part 1 video where I showed the regulator board out of the unit it means that if your back pins out on that connector J1 for the regulator board or you disconnect these two connectors here from the motherboard which I also showed in the previous videos it means that you don't get the ground path coming back to the regulator board and thus the regulator board doesn't work so it leads you into this false pretense that the issue is in the regulator board and you start looking at that not realising there's nothing wrong with it it's actually the fact that these two connectors are disconnected and the reason why I'd unplugged these is so that 
I could try and get the supplies out the regulator board um, you know obviously without any load external to it and to check that separately and obviously in this context you can't do it and I actually created a diagram um, which shows the relationship of the power supply uh, the regulator board and then the motherboard and we've actually got um, a ground connection coming back um, to the regulator board externally to it and it's a bit of a strange way that uh, HP Agilent have done it where they've somehow got a ground return coming back from the motherboard in the other direction and obviously without that then you know we won't get the regulators a, a ground reference so be aware of that if you're testing these uh, they can be a bit tricky um, I'm just looking now to see if I can find which one it is but basically um, the grey wire which is the return on the power supply is linked from um, pin 10 to pin 8 in the power supply um, and we've got a return that goes to the motherboard and then that essentially gets connected back um, from the motherboard here back to the regulator board there's a, like a little link on the motherboard that links it back and you'll only see that if you look at the motherboard underneath where the plugs are there's a little link trace and of course that particular wire um, is um, the negative supply if you like for the 14 volt rails for the regulator board so they've isolated to earth basically uh, there's a, a minus 5 volt, well, a, a 5 volt rail return earth which is taken to this regulator board. But the 14 volt rails, the earth for that isn't taken to this board, regulator board directly. It goes via the motherboard and then back. So by unplugging these, just means that the regulator board effectively floats with DC volts up to about 30, 14 volts, no matter what you test on the board it'll always be 13 14 volts in relation to the return on the power supply if you're making your ground return reference there for your DVM so it gets very very complicated and it can lead you off down all sorts of different avenues looking at different things which are not actually faulty and uh, of course as I said earlier Agilent hasn't helped matters by naming the plug on the power supply the same reference as a plug on the regulator board and again the pins are all different and uh, you can cause yourself no end of problems so where we're at at this stage is although we've got the test set working in and the test set works perfectly by the way there's nothing wrong with it all the functions and everything all work the self tests the measurements are correct it's working on 110 volts AC at the moment and if you turn as I demonstrated in part 2 the variac up to beyond a certain voltage, about 220 volts, the test set goes off. And so we can't establish any power until we turn that back to 110 volts again. Switch it off and then back on again. It goes into some kind of like a, as we demonstrated earlier, like a fold back. Um, and so basically what happens is, is we end up with no power. Back at 110 volts. And the thing works, you know, it boots up, it functions as it should do. And it's uh, such a shame that it's, it's beaten me as this. I'm uh, obviously either going to have to buy another power supply at some stage when they become available on the second hand market. Or I'm going to have to design a power supply separately myself to go in it. Um, small enough to give all the supply rails that's needed. Um, but what I did before I reached this stage is all the values of all the components are spent many hours desoldering every single resistor capacitor diode and measuring it separately out of the circuit to check its value and um, the one or two resistors which were uh, said that they were say 2k and there was a 2.2k in place uh, the guy who had repaired it prior to me had uh, put the slightly higher value resistors in so I changed them to precise values as indicated on the diagram but I cannot get to the bottom of it why 
when it operates at a voltage above 220 volts that the output drops off. What we did do in the previous test is we took a sample of the frequency coming out of the transformer, the switching frequency, and we examined that on the Rigol scope. And when the voltage input reaches around about 200 volts, the switching frequency goes way, way above, in my, in my view, what it should. And I think it exceeds the switching capability of the diodes, the rectifiers. And I think that partly explains why uh, when it's working at 110 volts and it's switching at 65 kilohertz, that's within the tolerable switching range of the rectifier diodes. But I think once it gets beyond sort of 70, 80 kilohertz, I think it uh, rapidly falls off in, insofar as the rectifier diodes um, from being able to accurately switch that at that frequency and, and thus rectify the, the voltage properly and the current. So there's some kind of, still at this stage with regard to 240 volt operation, some kind of frequency instability in the fact that the frequency goes higher and higher the more voltage that gets applied to the input. And now the power supply works perfectly, uh, 12 volts, I've tested that already, I've put 12 volts in through the DC socket and that works perfectly, no problem at all, you know, so technically I could power it from 12 volts if I wanted to. Or if I have a 110 volt transformer, I could power it from that. So yes, unfortunately in this case, this particular power supply has beaten me. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm used to, in past tense, having service manuals for equipment which give you a theory of operation explanation as to what each component or part of the circuit does. You know, and it would explain, for example, that, you know, C1 with TR1 and R1 interact to give an output frequency of x kilohertz which is then passed at uh, 1 volt peak to peak to R2 uh, which is amplified by uh, by TR4 and then passed to Q1 switching into transformer blah 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 and so from a theory of operation description of how the circuit should work you do tend to be able to understand more and understand how it regulates the switching frequency. Bear in mind the load's not changing on the output um, when we were carrying out these tests. It was a constant load and yet when you up the voltage the frequency went way way above what I think it should be and that's why I think it falls out of regulation. So I'm happy in the sense that we have done a repair, albeit in part, you know. I mean obviously the test set works when I bought the test set originally it was blown, there had been previous repair attempts on it by others which is always a bad sign because you don't know what the people have done. Um, there was evidence internally that some of the screws weren't correct that were in the chassis. Um, there were all kinds of little indicators that you know there's been various hands in here before me. So I'm going to have to admit defeat on this for the time being. I'm happy that it works, I can power it from 110 volts or 12 volts DC and it works fine. So with that I'm going to close this down now and uh, say goodbye to everybody and thank you for watching the videos. I'll do some more videos on other repairs and test equipment and microwave and RF components that I have as well.